In this book called the Bible, there's a book toward the end of it called Hebrews. Hebrews 11, chapter 11, that's known as the chapter of faith. Hi, Daniel. I saw you guys sitting on that front row last week. I like that. Keep that up. Is that because that's all that's left when you get in? That's wonderful. I love that. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, Without faith, which uh, Corey mentioned having faith, without faith, no one can please God. Anyone who comes to God must believe that he is real, must believe that he is real. Circle the word real. We're not talking about pie in the sky. We're not talking about speculation. We're talking about reality. Anyone who, anyone who comes to God must believe that he is real and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Life is like a jigsaw puzzle, only you don't have a picture to put it all together. Now I'm going to move away from the mic for just a moment, but uh, I have a 1,000-piece puzzle right here, and uh, I have no picture. Life is like a jigsaw puzzle with no picture to put it together. If I said, now some of you are jigsaw puzzle people, you would start working on it, and it's a pretty tough one. I saw the picture. <laughs> but not only in our individual lives, but in our lives collectively, currently around the globe, in this community, and all of history, if you don't have a big picture, you can't put it all together. You've got to figure out where we fit in, how God is working in that. And that's why we're going through this book called The Story, which gives us a narrative on God's story through the whole Bible. It gives us a big picture, and it leads us to this book called The Bible. And I hope you're reading along. This week we were to read chapter 2, which says God builds a nation. And it talks about... A lot of things in that reading in chapter 2. But we're going to focus on the main person, aside from God, including God, in these words that are shared in chapter 2. He's a man named Abraham. And so that's the focus today. But we got to have the big picture. It's the big picture of history. It's the big picture of your family life. It's the big picture of the world we now live in. You cannot figure out how all pieces fit together or your piece fits in unless you have God's story. It's the only way it makes sense. God is real, and he is the one working together, put all the pieces together, even when some of the pieces seem to be broken. So, how does God make his story? How does he make his story? I just listed some questions this morning. How does he make his story? Astoundingly, God makes his story by working with people. Now, if I were God, that would not have been my approach. Because it is very difficult to work with people. Now, I'm an exception. It's not hard to work with me. But I've been around a lot of people. It's hard to work with them. But God chose to work with people, and he has chosen to work with you. And life is messy, but God continues to work, and he works with us. What is the type of person that God uses? I don't like the word use so much because we have this connotation of you using people. God does not use you. Did you hear that? You are not a puppet on a string. This is not Kermit the Frog. This is life. And God created us in his own image so that he could work with us. He does not use us. He says, will you partner with me? And so he works with us. And God is making history as he works with people. Now, um, there is a story going on right now in the 21st century, the year 2012. It's in the news every day, and it's about a people in the Middle East. There is a tiny nation called Israel, and all around are these Arab nations. And it's continual conflict between Israel and these nations, it's continual conflict within those countries themselves with civil war and 
Syria and fighting with Turkey and you got all the stuff, Libya and Egypt and all those things that are going down. How do you make sense of all those pieces of the puzzle? Well, what's amazing is God tells the story of how all of that conflict began and he told the story from the perspective of 4,000 years ago. That's what chapter 2 is all about. Israel and the Arabs and even us Christ followers, through this book called the Bible, he gives us, this gives you a big picture. In fact, you're in here. And this, this book is 66 books, really. It's uh, about 1,089 chapters, approximately 775,000 words. But it gives us the big picture of what's going down today. So when God wanted to work with people 4,000 years ago, who did he choose to work with? Who did he choose to work with? He chose to work with a guy named Abram. Abram. Now, what an important person Abram is in our story, because the Bible clearly says that Abram is even the father of your faith. How many here have faith to believe God is real? Well, that is, you're in the lineage of Father Abraham had many sons, had many sons, had father. That's enough, that's enough. <laughs> Some of you have been around way too long. God chose a man named Abram. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And then here it is, what God lays out. Who's, the, who's talking to Abram? Now let me ask you a question. Does God talk to you? Now, I'm not talking about, some people say God's talking to them all the time. You go, I don't think so, you know. But God wants to talk to you. He wants to talk to you. And he will talk to you if you listen. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. This is Abram. And I will curse those who curse you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And this is God's word, his promise to this man Abram 4,000 years ago. And that relationship between God and Abram has touched our lives today. So I want to give you a little overview of that history 4,000 years ago. So watch the screen. I hope it will come up and just give you a little picture of God building a nation. There once was a man named Abram who was a descendant of Noah. God told him to move with his wife Sarai an entire family away from where they live. God made a promise. I will make you into a great nation and bless you. And all of the people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram and his family left. At one point, they stopped and God told him to look around. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your children. Then, one night, God took Abram outside. Look up and count the stars. This is the number of children you will have. But Abram was already 75 years old, and Sarai was way too old to have children. So they decided that Sarai's servant Hagar should have Abram's child. Hagar became pregnant and gave birth to a son named Ishmael. Yet God told Abram again, you will be the father of many nations. God changed their names to Abraham and Sarah and promised that it would be through Sarah that God's blessing would come. Exactly as God promised, Sarah became pregnant, giving birth to a son named Isaac. When Isaac was still a young boy, God told Abraham to take his son up on a mountain and sacrifice him. Abraham took Isaac laid him on an altar, and took out his knife to kill him. But an angel stopped Abraham, and God provided a ram to sacrifice in place of Isaac. 
Years later, Abraham and Sarah died and left everything they owned to Isaac. Isaac married and had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau was Isaac's favorite, and as the oldest, he was set to gain his father's inheritance. But Jacob wanted the inheritance, so he came up with a scheme to trick his father, who was now old and blind, into promising it to him. He dressed in Esau's clothes and put animal skin on his hands because Esau's hands were very hairy. Confused, Isaac gave his blessing to Jacob and promised him the inheritance instead of Esau. This caused a huge fight, one that almost ended in murder before they went their own ways. Thankfully, they reunited and God promised to bless Jacob's family. Jacob had 12 sons of his own. And like his father and grandfather before him, Jacob had a favorite son. Little did Jacob know that his favoritism would put his son, Joseph, in danger of being killed by his own brothers. I know that some of you probably watch a soap opera or two along the way. Not many, but some of you at the time. I'm telling you, you read chapter two in the story, there is no soap opera better than that story. When you look at the conflict and the jealousies and the father was favoring this son and the mother was favoring this son and the mother went around the father to trick, she was a schemer, that one. And uh, then her son became a schemer, that's what his name meant. And uh, on and on it goes. Uh, but in the midst of it, God is working. In fact, God promised that he would work through a man named Abram, whose name became Abraham. Now, how ironic. Why would God work with Abram? Abram meant father, and he and Sarai had been married many years and had no children. Hello, what's your name? Father. Where are the kids? We have none. What's your name? Father. And then God, if you notice as you go through this story, God really makes a big deal about names. Like Chris, Cynthia. Makes a big deal about names. Jesse. It's important to God. And so he turns Abram's name. He says, you're no longer Abram, but I'm going to call you Abraham. So now he became, rather than father, his name became father of many nations. No kids. And Sarai, which means princess, her name was changed to Sarah, and that meant queen, because she would join with her husband, Abram, and they would give birth to a nation. But how funny those names would be given when these folks, why would God choose Abram? First of all, now be encouraged. First of all, his family were idol worshipers. They had all sorts of different idols. He came from a land... Uh, the uh, Ur of the Chaldeans, and all of his family around him were idol worshipers. He was born into a family of idol worshipers. Amazing. Those pagans didn't know the real God. And in the midst of that, God spoke to Abram and said, hey, leave, go. So first of all, why would God choose Abram? He came from a family of idol worshipers. I don't know what your family background is, but it doesn't really matter. Because God will speak to you, and he will have a direction for you. Another thing is, uh, when God spoke to him and said, hey, you're going to be, he, he took him out, showed him, said, look at the stars. If you can count them all, that's how many kids you'll have. I mean, that's your family. And uh, what? And uh, Abraham was 75. And Sarah was 65. And um, last time I checked, that gets pretty tough to have kids at that age. But God said, you will have kids. They'd been married many years, and they still hadn't had any kids. And as the story goes, some of you know, um, about 10 years later, they decided God wasn't coming through fast enough. We'll help him. So um, we'll get to that in just a minute. But it wasn't until Abram was 100 years old that his son Isaac was born. Sarah was 90, and uh, Abraham was 100 and God used this 
man who came from idol worshipers used a couple that was too old. By the way, at 75, would you want to move away from your family and your country and everything you knew? Uh, I found the older I get, the less I like to change. And uh, how many seniors does it take to change a light bulb? Why does it need changing? <laughs> we don't like change. But at age 75, it said, and Abraham left and headed out to a land he didn't even know where he was going, but he followed God. Lots of problems, but God still used him. So let me ask, would God work with you? If God would work with Abraham, would he work with you? And I love this verse. I love this uh, verse I put in your notes. The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And, and circle the word remember. Remember that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. There aren't many of us in here, if there's anybody, that were wealthy or wise or really got your act together. God picked us because he works with people. It's incredible. Why you? Why would he work with you? Why would he work with me? Because God loves to work his strength through our weaknesses. My grace is all you need. My power shows up best in weak people. Some of you sit in this room today, you're too young. Say, man, I wish I was older so I could make my life count. Some of you are too old. I wish I was younger so I could make my life count. Some of you are too Iowan. I wish I could make my life count. Some people say I'm too much this or I'm too much Portuguese or I'm too much that, too much of this. Some of you are too poor and some are too slow and some are too shy or some are too, you name it. But God works through weak people. He'll work through you and me if we let him work. You see, Abraham was too old. These are uh, people from God's story in the Bible. Abraham was too old, and Isaac, he was insecure, and Leah was unattractive. She was the ugly duckling of the family. And uh, she got slid in there secretly, married to her husband, and she wasn't very attractive. Could God work through her? Joseph was a slave. Moses stuttered. Gideon was fearful. Samson was proud. Rahab was a prostitute. A little iffy there, God. What are you doing? David had an affair. Elijah was suicidal. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah was disobedient. Naomi was a widow. Mary was a poor teenage girl. John the Baptist was eccentric. Peter was impulsive. Martha was too busy. The Samaritan woman, she had five husbands, and she was living with a man she wasn't married to. Thomas had his doubts. Paul was a sick man, and Timothy was timid, and yet God used every one of them. <laughs> and no matter who you are or where you are today, God can use you. He can work with you. Now, that's the key, not just using you. Here, I'm God. You want to use me? No, no. Work with. Everybody say, work with. In other words, it's a dynamic relationship with the Almighty God that he would work through you. And what is your part in the story? Because all you bring, how many really believe God is real? How many would then believe that's the only way you can get the right big picture? And that everything you have has been given to you from God. Directly or indirectly, everything you have has been given to you by God. So what do we bring back? What do we do? How can we, what's our part in the story? How do we engage? How do we become like Father Abraham? Here it is. I think it's a blank on your notes. Trust in God. The journey of life is all about learning how to trust in God. And I found that I thought, man, I was trusting him so well. And bam, I hit something in the, in the present. And I go, ah, oh, God, I'm not trusting you so much. The journey of life is all about walking, and that was the way it was with Abraham, walking with God and learning to trust him. What does the scripture say? And that's taken from the book of Genesis. This is written in the book of Romans. Abram believed God, 
and it was credited to him as righteousness. So, what does believing God look like? And that's what we're trying to get to today. And Let's just do it. We can get these points in, right? How many are still stumped by looking at the jigsaw puzzle pieces and there's no picture? Is that driving you nuts? Good, at least I got your attention. What does believing God look like? Hang on, we're going to go fast, because our father Abraham gives us a pattern. The Lord had said to Abraham, go. And so Abraham said, I'll think about it. No. God said to Abraham, go, and Abraham left. He, that is trusting God. Trusting God is not sitting on your hands and saying, well, I'm just here trusting you. You must work with God. He does not do it solo. He works with you. He gives you the word, and then he says, you want to join me? Abraham trusted God, and he went, age 75. By faith, Abraham, when called to go, obeyed. This is Hebrews 11, 8. Obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he's going. Now, how many here legitimately think today, sitting here, no matter what your age, that you actually know where you're going? <laughs> now, that's pretty good. You know, you may have some plans for your future, but do you really know where you're going? This last week, a mother buried her 53-year-old son. Do you think that was where they thought they were going? Are you following me? But wherever God leads, will you go? And I'm not just talking about geography. I'm talking about leading your life. See, trusting God. I'll uh, stay with the notes, Dennis. Here we go. Number one, faith is trusting God. Wherever I am, wherever I am, to show me the way to wherever I may be going. I don't know if the rest of that's on your notes, but let me say it again so you can get it, because I took a long time thinking number one through. Faith is trusting God wherever I am. doesn't matter where you are today. You know, I, I'm, I'm mindful of Justin. Where's Justin? Where are you sitting, buddy? You know, he said, uh, I didn't have a father, but I have a heavenly father. Now, it's just like God to choose someone like Justin to become a great father. And to use Justin in such a way that his fathering would be an encouragement and a model for other fathers. Isn't God crazy? Isn't he amazing? Faith is trusting God wherever I am to show me the way to wherever I may be going. And as much as you think you may know where you're going, you really don't. But wherever it is you're going, that you trust God where you are today. Does that make sense? Okay, whew. I got this book a couple years ago called Stanley Complete Plumbing, Ed. And it, of course, it's a man's book because it's got lots of pictures. And I love to read. I am a reader. And I got this book a few years ago because I was thinking, man, I'm going to do some plumbing work around my house. And I, got, I thought this was fascinating. I'd sit down and read a little bit and look at the pictures. <laughs> and you know what? Two years have gone by, and I've read about plumbing, but I've done nothing. Okay, you ready? This book, God's Story, is not about information. It's about inspiration. This book is not about information. It's about application. This book is not about information. It's about transformation. As we trust God and we walk with him, then he works in our lives and changes us. But it's not about, oh, I got to read that story. What's that all about? It is about God speaking to you and changing your life so you can be the somebody that he chose you to be. <laughs> I love you, Mike. Oh, trust God. You got to look at, there's some verses there. I'm not going to read them to you this morning that follow right after. Number two, you got to read them slow. Faith is, number two, we're taking this from Abraham and for our own lives. Faith is believing God 
against seemingly impossible circumstances. Against seemingly impossible circumstances. I bet most of the people in this room, you would say there is a circumstance, there is a relationship, there is a situation that is impossible. But it is not impossible with God. Now, it may not go the way you think it ought to go, but it is not impossible. Remember the bumper sticker? Have you ever seen the saying? It says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I just got to tell you, God said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. So, it is believing God for me. Do I really believe God? Do I believe God is real? Do I believe God rewards? Do I believe God keeps his promises? See, we gather together like this for a couple hours every week. Hopefully, in some measure, we encourage each other to believe in God, to trust the God who is real. But the real test comes when we leave later, when we're out of here for the next 164 hours, 66 hours. Come back again next week. You're all invited back next week for our hospitality. Now, let me just tell you what faith is not. And you've got to read those verses in Romans that I didn't read to you. But let me just tell you simply, because we get off on tangents. Let me tell you what faith is not. Faith is believing God against seemingly impossible circumstances. But faith is not believing God so that I can tell him what I want him to do. If I just believe enough, I can tell God what I want him to do. Now, there's a lot of that kind of thing going around. If you you listen, people say, you just claim it. Well, you're not in charge. Did you turn to the person next to you and say, you're not in charge? I may not be in charge of everybody, but I'm in charge of you. (laughs) So, God took Abram outside, he showed him, he said, look at the stars, and he said, your, your children will be more numerous than the stars. Problem, no kids. Now, if, if you were to title your story, what would your story be? I put down four options, let me give them to you quick. If you were to title your story, what would it be? Would it be no way? In other words, God says, this is... This is what I would like. This is where I want you to go. This is what I would like to work out with you. And you go, no way. No way. The second one is halfway. Well, let me just I'll put my foot in a little bit and see if I like it. The halfway will kill you. Don't go there. Don't go there. It's better no way than halfway. The third title for your story might be my way. And that's what happened to Abraham and Sarah. They said, hey, God, you're not coming through fast enough. So I find it an interesting story. Isn't the Bible, I mean, the days of our lives, as the world turns. So no children, 85 and 75, and Sarah comes up with this brilliant idea. Hey, listen, husband, I have this servant named Hagar. Why don't you sleep with her? I mean, this is in the Bible. (laughs) He said it in church. Oh, man. It's in the Bible. And Abraham, being the great husband that he was, said, sure, let's do it. (laughs) That's what he said. And Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. Of course, the husbands are going, (laughs) are you with me? So we do it our way, my way. I will do it. Listen, I, I know God said this. It's not going as fast as I want. I'm in. And so I'll do it my way. Now, my way, in this case, Abraham and Sarah's way created conflict, as I mentioned earlier, because Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. And Abraham loved his son Ishmael. But that was not the promised child. And God said, I'm going to bless Ishmael, and he's going to be a wild donkey. And there will be conflict with him and his brothers from now on. And Ishmael is the father of the Arab nations. 
And then later, Abram and Sarah gave birth to Isaac. And Isaac and Ishmael have been in conflict ever since. Because Abraham and Sarah said, I know the promise, I will do it my way. Now, how many here would say there have been times when you've done it your way? What's amazing is God can still work with us even when we've messed it up. And so the fourth title for our story, hopefully, that we want to have is God's way. His way, that I do it his way. Sometime later, okay, so now we're doing, we're going to land it right here, Scott. Maybe. Maybe. So faith, trust in God. How many, let me just emphasize, how many have heard me say, how many have understood me to say, faith is not sitting on your hands? A lot of people say, oh, I believe God, but it's passive. It's like, if God's going to work, he knows where I am. Faith is active. It means I work with him. It means, let me ask you, now, I don't mean to be crude. I'm just using the Bible and say, listen, look, 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 look. Abraham and Sarah really believed God. But did they have to cooperate in order to have Isaac? I'm giving the obvious here. Could they have just stood back and said, okay, God promised he's going to give us a son. Pop! Ain't going to happen. They still had to do their part. Are you following me? Faith is not passive. Faith is actively interacting and following God when he speaks to us. We've really blown it because a lot of people say, I believe in God, but they are not actively believing God. They said, I made a decision a while back. I believe God is real, but you don't pay him any mind from here on. Well, I, but I, I believe in him. Well, that's wonderful. So does the devil. He believes in God, but it is a faith, walk, relationship with God. So, here's the wrap of old. Are y'all doing all right? Because this is, this is really the uh, cherry. In Genesis chapter 22, we have a story that is remarkable. It is like, how do we understand this? It was put in the... Uh, painting when it when they drew what they call an altar now we talk in church terms about altars all the time but technically there is no altar we'll call that communion table the altar when we were growing up in church you'd say come to the altar where did that idea come from or when you get married we kneel at the altar it is the point of worship it is the place of worship it is when we put whatever it is we're supposed to put there on the altar as a sacrifice we're giving it to god are you following me? We give our marriage to God. They're kneeling here, this couple today, as you've gathered in holy matrimony. They are giving their life, their marriage to God. They're at the altar. So we may say, come to the altar. And some of you go, what is that? Well, just picture having a table, and that's where you come, and you put your most precious possessions on that table. And you say, God, it's yours. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? I'm sorry. But we talked about it just, uh, we talk about it all the time. So sometime later, God tested Abraham. It was probably about, Abraham was about 115. Um, Isaac was a teenager. Can you imagine, no offense to the teenagers, but can you imagine being 115 and raising a teenager? You got that? You, you thought your life was tough. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to Abraham, he said, Abraham, importance of names, take your son. Here I am. Then God said, take your son. Now, for those of you who have been in church for a long time, see if you can follow the language. God never misses. God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, and sacrifice him there. Only one son, the son of promise. God says, I want you to give me your son. The son of promise. The son that you love. The apple of your eye. 
Dad, I want you to put him on the altar. I want you to give me your son. In Genesis 22, 3, it's not in your notes. It says, early the next morning, Abraham set out. No hesitation. No, let's think about it for a week. Let's, uh, could we confirm that word again? It says, and Abraham set out early the next morning. This is the first time in the Bible the word worship is used. When you get to Genesis 22, it is the first expression of the idea of worship. To say we worship God. We worship God because of who you are. I offer you my life. I sing a song of love to you because of who you are. I offer you my life and some of the things that I have. Because of who you are, I offer you my life, surrendering my all, a living sacrifice to you because of who you are. That's what God asked of Abraham, surrendering the most cherished person in your life. Would you give me your best? Faith is surrendering. You know, if you want to summarize the word worship, it's not just about music. It's not just about prayer. If you want to summarize worship in one word, the word is surrender. Surrender. Faith is surrendering to God whatever he asks for. Surrendering to God whatever he asks for. Worship is surrender. Now, it seems kind of odd, but you just have to keep reading the story. Remember what they were coming out of, a pagan culture. But nonetheless, what God asked Abram to do, he did. And Abram said to his servant, stay here while I, go, I and the boy go over there. And notice what Abram's faith was. He says, we will worship, and then we will come back to you. The word we. Abram's faith, I'm going to go kill my son, and then we'll come back. Well, can you imagine seeing the things that God had given to him and promised him and was still working out, and his faith did not waver. He said, I will surrender what I have. My most valued possession, my greatest treasure. Okay, how are you doing? So how many here would be willing to surrender all? You see, this story in Genesis chapter 22 in the Bible is what we call foreshadowing. It is a hint of what is to come in the story. And so God led Abraham and Isaac and his servants to a place called Moriah or Mount Moriah. In 1 Chronicles 3.1, it is said that Moriah is the place where they built the city of Jerusalem. And 2,000 years after Abraham and Isaac went to Moriah... A father came to Jerusalem and offered his son on a mountain. Only he gave his son, his one and only son, who he loved very much. And he gave his very best. And that son died on a cross because of God's love for you and for me. 4,000 years ago, this man... Abraham went and offered his son 2,000 years later. God the Father gave his son for us. And 2,000 years later, in the year 2012, we sit together here because of God the Father's sacrifice for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, I got to tell you, there's only 999 pieces in here, maybe, because I have one piece. For those of you who put together jigsaw puzzles, have you ever put together the whole puzzle and then you couldn't find one piece? And when you look at the puzzle, what do you notice about the puzzle? One piece is missing. 
So my question to you is, are you the missing piece in the jigsaw puzzle? Are you surrendering to God? Are you trusting God with your life? And then I want to be more specific because uh, some of you have uh, diseases in your body. Some of you are single parents and you just don't know how you're going to put it all together. Some of you are teenagers and you just don't know how you can put up with your parents any longer. And we laugh about that, but it's not funny to the teenager. Some of you have lost loved ones, and you still are having a hard time with that. Because of who you are, I surrender all. Putting my pain on the altar, putting my struggle on the altar. Some of you are without jobs. Can you put that on the altar? Zoe read earlier, don't worry about all these things. Seek first God, and he'll take care of us. And that's what it means when we say we're going to put this on the altar. Not some general thing. Yeah, God, here I am putting it on the altar. I'm saying, what is it you're carrying you need to surrender to God? Something that you've held on to and you're clinging to. Maybe your family is too busy. You've got too much going on. You've got too many bills. You got more bills than money left over at the end of the month. You need to put your finances on the altar. Surrender to God. Oh boy, I got to. Nope, those are mine. You have a, a wayward child. Where would you put that person? Some of you have been carrying way too much. What about. Uh, you get the idea? What is it you need to surrender? I'd like to ask you to stand with me this morning. And here's my simple invitation. If you'll just hold for a second. And I got started late and I had a long, but that's no excuse. Thanks for your patience. My question to you is, is there something bugging you in your life? My question to you is, is there something you're clinging to that you need to give over to God? My question to you is, is there a problem that you haven't surrendered to God? You're still trying to fix it. Is that problem a person you need to give them to God? Are you following me? It's a reality. It's something that we do, not as some tokenism, not as a let's go through the ritual, but we trust God and we will surrender this to God. Maybe it's a broken relationship. You don't see how that's ever going to get put back together. And maybe it'll never get put back together, but you need to put it on God's altar. Give it to him as a sacrifice. Some of you, oh, I could go on and on. Have I punched most, most of you yet? So I just want to ask you if you've got something, and I, I, can, I can close my eyes, and I don't know everybody. I wish. It's amazing when you read the story how much God calls us by name. Abraham, here I am. I, I wish I could call you all by name. God can. That's where he starts. Chris. Chris goes, here I am. I want you to come and put your best Sacrifice your best. Give me your all. Here I am. Bob, here I am. Right? Mark, here I am. Daryl, here I am. So I want to invite you, if you've got something you need to put on the altar, I'm not talking about general. I'm talking about specific. I want to invite you just to Step forward. You're not all going to be able to touch the uh, altar here, but just as an indication, it's, a, it's an indication that we're putting it on, and then we're going to have a prayer together and say, here it is. Here's my Isaac. What do you need to worship God to surrender to him today? Would you just come forward if that's you? Say, hey, I got something. I got to surrender. I'm going to put it on the altar. Thanks for joining with us today in our live streaming of our service and our message, we're grateful that you joined with us. 
And if we can serve in any way, we'd be glad to do that. Just check out our website. That'll get you connected in any way that you might like to. And uh, that is greenvalleychurch.net. And we wish you the best and know that you really do matter to God. Have a great day.